Christians, or whether you're here live at South Street. Can I hear a quiet hello? There we go, a quiet hello as we have a group of people here at South Street with us, which is very exciting. Um, I'm going to hand over to Alice, who's going to just share a bit about what we're going to expect through this time together. Yeah, really welcome if it's your first time amongst us. Uh, the way that this morning is going to work, um, so either if you're online or uh, in the building, you're just so welcome. And we're basically going to spend some time just fellowshipping online, in person. We're going to spend a bit of time worshipping, worshipping our Lord Jesus. Uh, this is our opportunity to lift praise to him. Uh, if you're at home, obviously, able to sing and do some expressive dance, wave some flags. That's totally what we do in our house, right, ladies? Um, uh, but obviously, if you're here in the building, just great to hear some humming um, going on. So... Uh, COVID relevant. Uh, then we're going to uh, hear a little bit of encouragement from um, stuff on the chat, uh, hear a, a Bible reading from another member of the Hearst clan, and then hear um, the next part of our series from uh, the wonderful Rich Bow Pitt, who I gather is off playing football this morning with some of our gentlemen from Oasis. Is that correct? They really are. They are sweating it out literally uh, on pitches uh, yesterday and today with our Monday night football crowd. We have a group of people both who would say they're part of the Oasis community uh, here as followers of Jesus and others who'd feel like part of the extended Oasis community is not yet followers of Jesus but love playing football and they're away uh, this weekend at a football tournament literally sweating it out. I'm not going to confess, I don't envy them at all. Um, but it's great to be here as Oasis family. And I really just want to encourage you, if you feel God speaking to you or got any encouragement for you, just put it on the chat. We're going to be looking through it. And we just want to hear what God's saying to us because we know he's moving. We know he's active. We want to hear what he's saying this morning. Um, I've just really been encouraged by um, a passage in, in Matthew that I just wanted to share with you just to, just to kick us off this morning. Because I don't know about you, but everything just feels a bit up in the air at the moment, doesn't it? We, we don't really know what the next few weeks are going to look like, let alone months or years years um and it was actually a, a, i felt it was a passage for a friend and you know sometimes you give a passage to a friend and you, you share in an encouragement way and then you feel god say and it's for you as well <laughs> so um so this is what i just felt god was was sharing me and I, I hope it brings some encouragement to you this morning so from matthew 7 um if you're familiar with the bible it's probably a story you've heard before um and it's jesus just describing a little analogy of, of just how safe we are when we put our trust in him so Matthew 7, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is, a wise, is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And... It, it feels uncertain, doesn't it? And I suppose that's what this parable shows us, is that um, even when we put our trust in Jesus, it doesn't make life easy and straightforward. You know, the winds still come and there's still waves and, uh, and uncertainty. But you know what? When our feet are fixed on the bedrock, that is Jesus. He doesn't move. He doesn't shift. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. You know, as we've moved from the back hall to the front hall, you know, he's the same God we're here to worship. It's the same faithful trustworthy reliable loving God that we're here to worship this morning and so let's do that let's just you know lift our praise to him in whatever way we can because he's here and he's moving and he's wanting to speak and encourage so I'm going to hand over to Andy and the band and we're going to worship him this morning Shame is a prison. Shame is a prison. As cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber. And he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer. Lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power. Where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grief. Hold my body down There ain't no grave Can I hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave my body down
Fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant, he's always telling me to run. Love is resurrection, and love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my giants down. There ain't no down Between death and life, there on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. He went on down to hell, and he took back every key. He rose as a lion, and he said, "On all the caps, free." How the grave I'm walking to If you walk out the grave I'm walking to If you walk out the grave I'm walking to If you walk out the grave I'm walking to If you walk out the grave I'm walking to If you walk out the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. 
If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walk out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you Celebration. We're choosing celebration, breaking into freedom. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. Let's sing that again. We're choosing celebration. We're choosing celebration, breaking into freedom. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts we cast aside our shadows we cast aside our shadows trust you with our you're the song you're the song of our hearts we're dancing we're dancing to the rhythm of your heart Rising from the ashes to the stars. We're dancing, we're dancing to the rhythm of your heart. We're rising from the ashes to the stars. You're the joy, 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 lighting my soul. define us the pain will not define us joy will reignite us you're the song you're the song of our hearts 
Let's sing that again, the pain. The pain will not define us. Joy will reignite us. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. The dark is just a canvas. The dark is just a canvas for your grace and brightness. You're the song, you're the song of our hearts. We're dancing, we're dancing to the rhythm of your heart. We're rising from the ashes to the stars. We're dancing to the rhythm of your heart. We're rising from the ashes to the stars. You're the joy, 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 lighting my soul. The joy, 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 making me whole. Though I'm broken, I'm broken into your arms. Yeah. 
Praise you, Jesus. You are good. You are good. The pain will not define us. Your joy will reignite us. Though I'm broken, I'm running to you. You are my joy. You are our joy. Lord God, we come before you now and we just receive that joy where we, where we need an extra top up maybe this morning. Lord, we're just receiving that. Your presence is here and it's moving. We're just receiving your joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I think it's just before we move on from this, just whether you're at home or you're in the room here, um, like God is longing to meet with you and with me. And um, it's not a hard thing. We don't have to go through some sort of routine or some sort of uh, kind of regime. It's like literally just open ourselves and just where you are, why don't you just close your eyes? Just as a way of saying, I don't want to get distracted by anything or anyone else. And... Maybe put your hands out. And putting our hands out can feel a really weird thing, but actually it's not. It's just like literally saying, I'm open. I'm open to you, God. I'm open with my life to you. And I'm open to receiving what you have for me. That's like literally what we're doing when we're lifting our hands. It's like like saying, this is me showing physically what I'm believing inwardly. And sort of pray for us. Jesus... I thank you that you are our source of joy. And I thank you that you said that you would send the Holy Spirit to us, within us, in order that we would know your joy and that our joy would be complete and would overflow. And I just pray for each of us that we would know that. I pray for those of us in this room here at South Street. I pray for those of us who are in our lounges, our bedrooms, our kitchens, our dining rooms, our studies, or sat out in the garden today. Uh, I, I just pray for each of us. Would you come, Holy Spirit, and meet with us? Great. Um, it's always good to spend some time worshiping together, either in person or online. You know, we are we are a family, and this is an opportunity for us to meet together. Even if you're doing this on catch up, you know God is still moving. God is still there with you and speaking to you. And it's just so encouraging to be able to spend that time. Um, but we're going to hear a little bit more about what life looks like for us, I suppose, as Oasis family. So, Adrian, I think you're going to update us a little bit on that. I am you? indeed, Alice. I'm going to look surprised. I, I'm not going to look surprised. And also, I think I'm going to flip cameras. This is going to be kind of comedy moment gold. So if you're watching this online, you know that this is going to be funny. Those of you in the room, you can just feel the sense of embarrassment and discomfort as I try and figure out which camera I'm looking at. But I think I'm going to go from this one to this one. We'll see if that happens. Uh, it does not look as though it is. Oh, yeah, there we go. Hello on this one. Why have I come on to this one? Because I wanted to just speak to you. Yes, you. Uh, as... Um, As we saw last week, I kind of said, I wonder if there's some principles that we need to live with as we navigate uh, tomorrow onwards, 19th of July onwards, as we uh, navigate um, this declaration of freedom. And what does that mean then? How do we do that as followers of Jesus? And what we said is, well, what it means is we use our freedom, as we always do, to love God and to love people. We then said that Out of that loving people, we want to be those that seek to prefer others over ourselves. As that's the model that we see in the life of Jesus. One who is willing to lay down his life for all. And then thirdly, we said that we want to be those that out of our love for God and love for people, we want to go to war with self-righteousness. We recognize this is a moment where actually uh, society around us may polarize of either saying, well, I'm in this camp or I'm in that camp, and I'm right and you're wrong, and I'm going to get increasingly angry about how wrong you are. But rather, we're to be those that that don't seek to camp out in any of those places, but rather seek to listen and understand and demonstrate love. And so with those principles in mind, I just wanted to talk about a bit of our practices then. How are we going to seek to practice things as we enjoy something more of the freedom that's been offered within those senses of saying, well, we're going to seek to still love God, love people. We're going to still seek to prefer others over ourselves. And thirdly, seek to ensure that we're not becoming self-righteous. And I think that's both as individuals, and I would also say as a church, let's make sure that doesn't happen. We're not going to be judging how others are navigating this moment. Um, I'd say that firstly, as we seek to do our practice, we have to realize that we're practicing within 
a place that we're earthed. Like literally we are in the city of Birmingham. We love being in the city of Birmingham. In actual fact that we often live with that uh, deep promise and uh, proclamation and uh, encouragement from Jeremiah 29 where God says to Jer- through Jeremiah to the people uh, to work for the good of the city they're in. Because if it prospers, they prosper. To pray for it and work for the good of it. And that's our heart for this city of Birmingham. We love it. We want to see Jesus revealed and glorified here. We want to work for the good of it. In actual fact, back in March 2020, we sought to make decisions before we were asked to by the government not to meet in order that we could work for the good of the city around us. And therefore, you won't be surprised that that's what's going to guide us as we kind of venture out on this point and seek over the coming weeks and months to say, okay, what does it mean for us to work for the good then of the city around us? Now, in respect to Birmingham, because we're in a densely urban center, we know that actually the numbers in respect to uh, getting COVID are in the increase at the moment. I know talking to people who are involved in hospitals, different uh, medics, they'd say that uh, they've seen an increase in terms of patients coming in at this point in time. And therefore, with this in mind, we have to say, well, okay, what does it mean then for us to work for the good of others? How do we keep seeking to love God and love people? And therefore, I think there's three practices that we're going to put in. Uh, I think we've learned through uh, government announcements. uh, Remember those ones? We haven't got any flags, I'm afraid, behind me. But they tend to do those three statements. So we thought, actually, not to be fun in terms of a lightness, but actually, hopefully, to be memorable. There'll be three things I think are going to help us in terms of practice First is to do with masks, second is to do with singing, and third is to do with space. So firstly, in terms of masks, what we're going to encourage people to do is when they're in South Street, in an in-person meeting, is to be continuing to wear masks. Now we recognize that for some, they're unable to wear masks for varying reasons, and therefore we don't want you to have to justify that. Please know that if you come and you're unable to wear a mask, you're not going to get judgment here. And I'd be encouraging other people to not be judging others if they're not wearing a mask. But I'd encourage you, if you can wear a mask, please do so when you're in the building, when we're gathered. As we feel like this is an important thing in working for the good of others. As generally, when we're wearing a mask, it's about the protection of others than ourselves. And we'll make sure there's loads of masks available here so that you can have a mask if you've not got one. Or if you forget one, there's always one that you can have. Uh, So that's the first thing, that we want to encourage the wearing of masks in the building. Second one in terms of singing. We do know that we've missed singing together. We've been able to sing in our homes, but in terms of gathering together to sing, we've not been able to do that. And therefore, we really want to give an opportunity to sing together. And so from next Sunday, we will be singing together, but it will be with masks on. So that's masks, that's singing. And then thirdly, space. So in terms of space, we just recognize that we're all going to need a moment of getting used to being around different people. We're also going to need a moment of ensuring that we're not just all crammed into a space. And therefore, we're going to start gradually to allow more people in on a Sunday. So that will mean is that we'll make uh, the more chairs available in terms of the ground floor. Uh, We'll kind of cause the spacing to be slightly less, but there'll be still some spacing between chairs. And we're also going to open open up the balcony that will enable people to sit up there. We're also going to enable the back hall to be used as a place where you can watch a live broadcast of what's going on in the front with others, able to sing with masks on, but within a more socially distanced environment. So there'll be a lot less people in that one. Because we just recognize for some that actually it just feels like a massive step to kind of go into any space. And so maybe that's a good next step for you. For others of us, we we know that actually to come back and be around anyone is going to feel too big a step at this point in time. And that's okay as well. We're going to keep the live feed. And so the live broadcast of all that's going on, you'll still be able to enjoy from your home. But in terms of those who are going to come and be part of us on a Sunday, I'd really encourage you, do feel free to come. We're not going to be asking people to book in. We feel like we can make capacity work just knowing that we've got space in the back, space where people will be staying at home. But also we want people to know that this will be us coming together as family. Therefore, there's not a cap in terms of how old you need to be or how young you need to be. 
It's like open to everyone. We're family together. And therefore, if you're a parent with children, we want you to know that you're really welcome. Uh, obviously, it'll feel different, uh, but we'll make sure the service kind of our gathering together kind of caters for everyone uh, in order that both lengthwise and what goes on, kind of everyone can be feeling part of it. Uh, so that's, I think, where we're going to head next Sunday. The other thing I'd say in terms of space is, can I ask us to be thinking about others when we see people for the first time? Like, I don't know how you're wired. For some of us, we'll be just like, man, I cannot wait to see people and run up to them and give them a big hug. hug. And I just say, like, sometimes that isn't what the other person wants. And can I encourage us to kind of start to use a different language? A language we've not had to do before, but one where we say, actually, as we meet people for the first time, we say, actually, is it okay if I stand here, or would you like me to stand a bit further back? Maybe it's saying, are you okay us having a conversation at the moment? Maybe it's saying, hey, I'd love to give you a hug. Are you okay with that? And here's the deal. If the answer is no to any of those questions, it's not a rejection. It's actually a proclamation of love. Is the individual feeling able enough to say to you, I actually, no, I'm not okay with that, and I trust you enough to hear that. And so let's keep moving forward by loving God and loving people. Otherwise, I'm going to hand over now to my daughter, Emily, who's going to read the scripture for us today as we continue in our joy series, and then we're going to hear from Rich Bo Pitt. Okay, thanks, ladies. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name. How do we respond when we're not feeling joyful? We've been looking together in this series that I have the privilege of continuing for us today about how we find joy, how the invitation to follow Jesus is an invitation to know joy, whatever we are facing. But what do we do when we're just not feeling it? when we've taken in all the information we think we need to know about the joy we have in God, about the wonder of who he is, when we've affirmed with our minds that we believe it to be true, and yet we just can't quite seem to get it to drip down here into our hearts. When we can't quite work out how to know that joy, not just in our head, but deep in our guts, what do we do? In other words, how do we fight for joy when it's hard? Because the reality is that for most of us, joy is not our natural state of being. And yet it's something that we are all seeking. As we've seen throughout this series, pursuing joy, even in suffering, even against threats to it, means learning how to be present in the moment, to centre ourselves on God, Father, Son and Spirit, and embrace him as the one who has done in the past all we need to know his joy and carry it into the future. And there's a daily choice for each of us to fight for it. And I know it is for me. What does your morning routine 
look like. Uh, mine uh, is being woken up by my Alexa alarm with a carefully curated routine that takes me through about 10 different steps in the morning. There's gentle ocean music to kind of ease me into the day. There's some worship songs to try and uh, fix my groggy mind uh, on Jesus. There's a few jokes, as you could well imagine. There's some interesting facts, some classic hits from the 60s, 70s and 80s. But even with all of that, even with the best routine that I can put together, I wouldn't say that I awaken every day filled with joy. Even when uh, I changed it to a rousing rendition of Three Lions in those heady days a week ago where we thought it might just be coming home, uh, that didn't quite do it. Uh, it certainly did not fill my wife with joy to be woken up in the morning yet again by uh, the dulcet tones of Badil Skinner and the lightning seeds. But I think that search for joy is also reflective of the rest of my life. So often over the past year, when so many of the things that have brought me joy have been stripped away, I've found the temptation to look for joy in all the wrong places. And each of us will have those things that we go to for comfort when we know that we aren't living with joy, even though we know deep down that they can't and they won't satisfy. Among other things, this past year or so has revealed the inadequacies of so much of the stuff in our lives that we'd been looking to for joy. And that it's only been because of the pandemic stripping them all away that we can see how dependent we've become on them. And as things here in Britain begin to open up again, however you're feeling about that, the danger is that we'll just try to rush back to where we were in February 2020, to reconstruct the scaffolding of stuff that came crashing down 18 months ago and has lain unused since then. And we'll miss the work that God is wanting to do with us in and through this hard and painful and long season. And that what God wants to do in us might just enable us to bear the fruit of joy in our lives for years to come. That's what I'm believing for. And in that passage that Emily so wonderfully read out for us, the psalmist expresses how they fight for joy in the present, celebrating in what God has done in the past and looking with hope to the future. And I want us to explore that today in two aspects. First of all, putting God at the centre. And secondly, living with God at the centre. So first of all, putting God at the centre. Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, wrote this. He said, we need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. And that daily rhythm of returning to God is something that we talk about a lot at Oasis, finding moments in our day to pause, to centre on him and to continue. And this is our foundational daily experience of fighting for joy, to consciously stop ourselves from allowing life to just roll on and to let God break in. To find moments where we get to see and savour Jesus, where everything else fades away and we get that clear sight of his presence with us, his greatness and power, his grace and comfort, his beauty and majesty. When we hear him knocking at the door, waiting to come in again, to not allow ourselves to be like the church in Revelation 2 who'd forgotten their first love who'd forsaken their first love, who forgot what it was to delight in God, our saviour, not just to acknowledge in him, not just to recognise him, but to delight in him. And this is what the psalmist does in verse one. I will exalt you, Lord, they write, for you lifted me out of the depths. Remember what it was like. 
that first moment of faith, that first moment where you really knew that God had stepped in and changed everything for you. Do you remember that? And if you don't know that, if you've never known that, do you want to? There's an invitation even now, right now, to come to Jesus and find the one who changes everything. When, as a community, we encourage one another to pause, we're stirring one another to take hold of the joy that we've known, the miracle of the new lives, new identities, new purpose, new community, new hope that we have in Jesus. And to celebrate in it again. To not allow ourselves to grow stale, but to be continually refreshed by choosing to fight for that joy. To remember what God has done in our lives. To hold on to that first love. And we'll each do that in different ways. For the psalmist, it's it's really lingering on what God has done in the past. So we heard that earlier, verses two and three. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down into the pit. That's what they wrote. They're remembering what God has done in their lives. They're calling it to mind and resting in it and using that to spark joy and spark worship within them. And that's a great pattern for us, that model of cultivating thankfulness, taking a moment to sit with and reflect on what God has done in our lives, the big and the small. Maybe it's keeping a thankfulness journal where you can jot those things down for you to remind yourself of them, especially on the days when you're struggling to see clearly what those things are. Perhaps it's getting out into nature And just taking the cues around you of the wonder of who God is and his goodness towards us. Maybe it's taking a psalm a day and working through it whenever for you you'll be at your most awake, most alert. Or building in a time of silence on your morning coffee break or committing to pray through the Lord's Prayer at midday as thousands of Christians around the world do, in in the words from the Bible and then again in your own words. However it is for you, what are the daily rhythms and patterns that are going to keep you coming back to the one who sparks joy? And it's so important for us that we make space in our days for this. Don't just try and find time here and there. Make time. Carve it out. Schedule it in. Uh, Andy Crouch, who is an author and speaker, writes this. I have to say no to requests many, many times a day. Almost always people are understanding. They often say, I know you're very busy. But the truth is, I'm not very busy. I try not to be very busy at all. But in order for that to be true... I have to say no many, many times a day. I think that is such wisdom for us in a world that just loves to move at a million miles an hour. Grow in your confidence to say no to things, even good things, even things you would love to say yes to, valuable, worthwhile things, things you love doing. In order to create the space in your life to fight for joy. This isn't a supplementary add-on to the walk of faith. If we don't learn to daily fight for joy, we'll find ourselves drifting away from that first love. So that's my first encouragement to us today. Keep God at the centre. Put God back at the centre. Second thing, live with God at the centre. And if my first point was primarily vertical about our relationship with God, 
This one is primarily horizontal, the way we live towards others. See, the Bible's teaching isn't just that we fight for joy in God as we spend time focusing on him. It's that we fight for joy by doing what he commands, by living in the way that he has called us to live. We fight for joy by learning to obey. Learning to obey. And I'm sure that for some of us, our first reaction to that word is to say, whoa, hold on a minute. Obey? Isn't it supposed to be that we are filled with joy by centering on God, as we've just explored, and then as an overflow of that joy, we go out and serve others and love others? And yes, it is that. But it is also that when we are struggling to know joy, one way that we fight for it is in choosing to obey God's word. Choosing to lay down our own rights, our own preferences and opinions and comforts and follow what he has said about how we are to live and about how we are to love others. It's not just that good works flow from grateful hearts. It's that those who have trusted in Jesus have known the moment where he breaks in and everything changes are now in him new creations. If you have put your trust in Jesus, well, whether you did it before you could even remember or whether you did it earlier today, you are a new creation. And because of that, you have the Holy Spirit working inside of you, working in and through your choices and your actions every day to do what? To magnify joy in God. That's what the Spirit loves to do within us. And he does that as we obey God's commands. God's commands are given so that as we obey, in faith, through Christ, by the power of the Spirit, we might step more into the fullness of the life that God has for us, knowing his power perfected in our weakness and leading to joy. And this is an idea that we can struggle with, particularly in the 21st century. We don't like following laws. We don't like following rules. We hear the word obey and we think of something oppressive. But this idea is one that is completely familiar to the biblical authors. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the whole Bible, is an extended meditation on the goodness of God's law and how obedience brings forth joy. Let me read you a few verses. Uh, these are all from the NLT. Verse two, joyful are those who observe his rules and seek him with all their heart. Verse 45, I will walk in freedom for I have devoted myself to your commands. Verse 111, your laws are my treasure. They are my heart's delight. Verse 143, as pressure and stress bear down on me, I find joy in your commands. And yet, this is so often the complete opposite of how we approach God's commands in Scripture. Our first reaction can so easily be to see them as stifling or as oppressive, to see God as one who wants to limit our freedom and stop us from doing the things that we truly want to do, stop us from doing the things that will make us the most us. Carmen Joy Eames really helpfully writes that God's law is like the fence that separates a kid's playground from a busy road. Does that fence prevent freedom? Or by stopping the cars from driving into the playground and stopping the kids from running out into the road, does it enhance freedom? By allowing drivers to drive safely and kids to play joyfully. 
we can read some of God com- God's commandments, particularly in the Old Testament, and especially in our cultural context where uh, many of them seem perhaps irrelevant to us or outdated. And we can wonder, do these really lead to life? But the Bible's teaching is that God's word isn't given to restrict our freedom. It's given, us, it's given to enable us to joyfully embrace the life that God has for us. It's given to us that we might flourish in our lives like a child delighting in a playground. And yes, we need wisdom to discern which commands, particularly uh, in the Old Testament, are for today and which were for the specific context that they were written into. But the key thing for us in fighting for joy is to see that the walk of faith is never just internal. It's never only spiritual. It is always practical and relational as well. Following Jesus means doing things differently. It means impacting your life and the lives of those around you. That as we give ourselves to loving and serving others, to showing hospitality, to pursuing prayer, to battling sin, to choosing kindness and standing for truth and confronting immorality and fighting for justice. In practical acts of love and mercy, the joy that is within us, our first love, gets magnified and multiplied in our lives. Mike Pilavachi puts it like this, obedience is God's love language. When we choose to obey, laying down our rights, our preferences, our feelings, particularly when it's hard, particularly when we really don't want to. And when we do that, when we allow God to come and meet us in that place and lead us into life, we open ourselves to experience more of his joy, his strength in and through our weakness. And as we do that, we'll get to finish where we started, to cry with the psalmist in Psalm 30, verse 4, to sing praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people, praise his holy name. Our fight for joy in him will catch us up in community as we give ourselves to putting God at the centre and living with God at the centre. And it will enable us to sing together of what he's done. And that's what we're going to do now. In just a moment, I'm going to hand back to Andy and the band who are going to lead us. But before that, I want to leave you with a challenge. How are you going to fight for joy this week? See, it doesn't take much to predict that at some point this week, you're likely to be really struggling to find joy. And in that moment, you'll have a choice to let the stuff of life steal your attention and fill your mind or to fight for joy, to put him back at the centre and live with him at the centre through your actions, through the way you treat others, through the way that you live. How are you going to fight for joy this week? Why don't I pray? Lord, in this moment, in each of our different locations, in our homes, at South Street, watching live or in demand, I pray in this moment that you would come again by your spirit. That you would lead us increasingly into life, the life, the abundant life, the free life that you have for us. 
I pray, Lord, that you would teach us this week how to learn to fight for joy. Not seeing it as a failure that we don't wake up every morning bursting with praise of you. But rather recognising that actually it's in our weakness. It's in our place of not feeling particularly joyful today. That you have something precious for us. That your desire is to come and meet with us and fill us again. That we might learn the depths of your joy now and in the future. I thank you for that, Lord. We praise you for it together. And we ask that as a community, you would draw us more and more deeply into your joy. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.
firm foundation Lord and we just want to rest in the in the joy that you're just filling refilling us with this morning what you've been speaking to us about Lord we just worship you and we praise you you are a good God you know what lies ahead you know where we're at you know what we need and you're ready and willing to meet us in that place and just fill us again with joy Lord we just need to be reminded again of the gospel truth we were just thinking about in our alpha this week we were talking about um, why Jesus died for us and the fact that um, we were just talking about the fact that even if it was just if it was just me, if just one person, that Jesus would have died. That, you know that he's he so loves us that even if it was one man, it'd be enough for Jesus to die. And just to rest in that gospel, and when that when we allow that gospel truth just to overwhelm us, it trans, it's transformative, isn't it? As Rich was saying. Um, and I know some of us will have seen these these books as well. Recalibrate and pause, and just what you know. It, for those of you that are this week, want to set aside some time, just to spend some time in God's presence and and be reminded of the truth of who the God is that we worship. I just encourage you to use those as well. Um, so as this meeting now draws to a close, yeah, did you want to add something? On there, Adrian, or no? No, nope, not at all. I think it was just very good, wasn't it? Rich is great as always. Wordsmith, extraordinaire. Uh, so yeah, really good. Yeah, so, um, but we're not finishing here. We've got an opportunity to hang out um, straight after this meeting. So on the chat, there'll be a little link coming up for a Zoom chat. So opportunity to grab probably an iced coffee rather than a hot coffee, and maybe an ice cream rather than a cake or a biscuit. Nice. Uh, bring it along to the Zoom hangout, uh, and it would be great to see some faces, catch up with how people are doing. Definitely, and just like over the summer, we just wanted to say that we're going to do things at different places points in different ways and so we obviously have moments where we gather here at South Street on Sundays we're also going to have a couple of Sundays uh, through August where we're kind of going occupy a local park and just invite everyone there and just hang out have picnic we just recognize that actually it's just good just to get used to being around each other and to catch up and outside in the sun is a good place to do that so we'll be doing that and keeping you posted with dates otherwise I think we're pretty much done today I think that's it I'm starting to think about picnics already (laughs) <laughs> definitely I do feel a little bit hungry anyway it is a goodbye from me it's a goodbye from me cheerio <laughs>